Products, we compute a few of those. There's this property we just went through. All right, let's go with some more algebraic properties of a dot product. So we get the commutative property. It doesn't matter which order you do a dot product, you'll get the same answer because you're just multiplying coefficients, or multiplying the corresponding coordinates and add them together. So it doesn't matter the order. The reason we call it a product is because of this rule right here. How do you think dot product works with addition? If you didn't know anything about the dot product, it's distributed. So that's the reason we call it a product, because it distributes across addition. So it works just like a regular product in that sense. Uh, we have the property above. I'll just rewrite it down here. V dot V equals magnitude V squared. So if you take the zero vector, so again, the zero vector is written as a really bold zero. I just circle around like four times or five times. What do you think the zero vector multiply, uh, do with the dot product with any other vector would equal? So we think about it, just think about zero, zero dot product with any, doesn't even matter what x and y are. Because when you get a dot product, you're gonna get zero x plus zero y. So if you do zero vector, uh, dot product to any vector, you're going to get the number zero. So the right size is the number zero, not the vector zero. So there's our algebraic properties. Well, we also get the regular multiplicative property with scalar multiples. <coughs> so if we have alpha u dot v, you can move your scalar around, or you can factor your scalar out like that. So I'll put one common misremembering uh, of these rules. There's probably more than one, but this is the one that I see. All right, this alpha does not distribute across multiplication. Why is that? Well, just think about regular multiplication. If we were working with numbers back in the good old days, two times three times four, is that equal to two times three times two times four? No, that would be an extra multiply by two in there. All right, so it doesn't work for numbers, doesn't work for vectors. So when you're multiplying, you don't get to distribute multiplication across multiplication. You distribute multiplication across addition. All right, so be careful. Don't make that mistake. And the next geometric identity we have there's two vectors u and v we can measure the angle between them doesn't matter how long the vectors are as long as they're not length zero because it doesn't make sense to talk about uh, an angle between a vector that has length zero so as long as your vectors are not zero Then you can relate the angle theta as cosine theta equals u dot v over magnitude u magnitude v. So that's how we can find the angle between two vectors. So 
So our first example, find the angle between B equals 3i minus j, and w equals 6i minus 2j. Oh, never mind. Let's do 6i plus 2j. All right, so find the angle between these two vectors. The only way I can relate angles to vectors is the identity right on the board there. That's the only a uh, real way to take two vectors in rectangular form and find the angle between them. So I'll just rewrite the identity. And one of our vectors is w. So we got w dot v over magnitude w magnitude v. So I'm just filling in these values. I like diamond notation. So I'm going to change to diamond notation. So it actually turns out the dot product is usually a faster thing to compute. So 3 times 6 plus negative 1 times 2 divided by. So I want you to compute the two magnitudes here and then simplify this down. So compute those two magnitudes and then simplify. And you're going to have two square roots in your denominator. So are there any simplified questions in here, magnitude questions? What's that? Square root. So <coughs> uh, this is that 400 is a 10 times 40 right there? Uh oh. So that's 10 times 40, uh, and then the square root of 400 is 20. All right, did I solve for theta? I almost solved for theta. So how do I get cosine out of there? Cosine yep, we're going to use the inverse function to move the function to the other side. So we got theta equals cos inverse. Four fifths, and of course, if you're typing into web work, this would be arc cos four fifths. So I'll take either of those two answers on uh, your midterm on Thursday, or your final exam, or wherever else you need an inverse trig function. But web work only takes the arc functions. So the next question I want to know, are these vectors parallel or not? So our first vector, 3i minus j. Our second vector, 6i minus 2j. So 
So do you remember the definition of parallel back, I think, last section? What does it mean? So we can draw two parallel vectors pretty easily, but what does it mean algebraically for two vectors to be parallel? So they've got to point the same direction. They don't have to be the same length, though. One could be longer or shorter. So they're scalar multiples, positive scalar multiples of each other. So that's one way to think about parallel. Actually, I didn't mean to erase that. <coughs> what would the angle between them be if they were parallel? It's a little silly to write this angle. What would the angle be between them? Yeah. It would be 0. I mean, technically, if I draw two parallel vectors, they're both going to be right on top of each other like that. So that would be a more correct drawing. And then the angle between them would be 0. They're pointing the same direction. And what is cosine of 0? Tough questions on a Monday morning. Cosine 0 is 1. All right, so if they're parallel, I should get that the cosine of the angle between them gives me 1. So let's go ahead and compute that. So v dot w, I'm just going to take their dot product right here. We get 3 times 6 plus 1 times 2. They're both negative, so it makes it positive. Magnitude v, I think we'll get the same thing. Square root 3 squared plus 1 squared. Square root 6 squared plus 2 squared. We get 20 over square root 10 times the square root 40, 20 over 20, which is 1. So cos theta equals 1, so that means theta equals 0 in this case. <coughs> so yes, they are parallel. Now, I could have checked parallel by seeing are they multiples of each other. So easier way so does such an alpha exist so that v equals alpha times w? What would alpha have to equal set up like this? What does alpha have to equal here? Almost. So if alpha is 2, I would do 2 times 6 is 12. So is there a positive, is there an alpha that's greater than 0 that makes this equal? There is, because we know they're parallel. So what number is it? It's almost 2. So there's two equations here. The x equation, 3 equals alpha 6. The y equation, minus 1 equals alpha times minus 2. What does alpha equal? One, one half. Very good. <laughs> I don't know why that was difficult. Because fractions suck. We'll blame it on fractions. Why blame yourself when you can blame fractions? All right, so I can move the alpha to the other side, and it would appear as a 2. You can always put the alpha on the other side as a reciprocal. All right, so that would be a way faster way to tell me they're parallel or not. Could you find this such alpha, or could you not find this alpha? All right, so parallel, you should not use this cosine uh, theta identity. That's not the fast way to figure out parallel. Let's think about perpendicular. So it's easy to draw perpendicular. So in this case, our angle is pi over 2. What's cosine of pi over 2? Cosine of pi over 2 is 0. All right. So u dot v over magnitude u magnitude v. 
So if they are perpendicular, we'll get that this cos theta should be 0. Now, of course, it doesn't make sense to talk about perpendicular if one of your vectors or both of them are 0, because they're not pointing in a direction if they're 0. So you want to make sure u is not 0, not the 0 vector, and v is also not the 0 vector. That's important algebraically in the form that we wrote down. If u or v are the 0 vector, what problem will we have over here? So if you know u is the 0 vector, what would the magnitude of the 0 vector be? Square root of 0, which will be 0. So you'd be divided by 0 if one of your vectors is 0. All right. So this doesn't make sense if you have a vector that's 0. But assuming your vectors are not 0, I can multiply by the denominator. So if I multiply by the denominator, I have u dot v equals 0 times any other number still 0. So I'm still going to have 0 on the right side. This is all you have to test to see if two vectors are perpendicular. You have to make sure they're not 0, and then take their dot product. If their dot product is 0, then they're perpendicular. So the test we're going to do, just check u is not 0, v is not 0, and u dot v is equal to 0. So if their dot product is 0 and they're not 0 vectors, that's how we know they're perpendicular. So are the vectors 3, negative 2, and 4, 6 perpendicular? So first of all, are either of these vectors the 0 vector? No. So all we have to do is take their dot product. So go ahead, take their dot product, and tell me is it 0 or not 0. So the next topic we're going to look at is projection. It's kind of similar to projection in psychology class, but uh, we're going to write down the algebra behind it. So what is projection in vector worlds? The best way to think about it is if you have one vector that's horizontal on the ground and the other vector is above the ground, <coughs> and you want to think about the light source being directly overhead. So it's shining down, directly down, and you want to look at the shadow. So if you project one vector onto another, it's basically like thinking about a shadow. One vector casts on the other vector. So the shadow gets projected down right here, so, such that there's a right angle. So the light is directly overhead, projecting downwards. And this vector down here, is the projected vector. So the blue vector is the projection. So we'll write some names on these vectors. So the original vector is v, and the other one will be u. Actually, I'll use, yeah, we'll go u and v. So this blue vector is a projection. The way we're going to write it is similar to a logarithm. So we're going to project v onto u. So I write it like it has a base of u, and then we're projecting v onto it. So it's a little bit strange to write it like this. The way I remember this is just the one down below is the one you're projecting onto. So that's one way to think about it. This formula I'm about to write down, 
will be on your cheat sheet. So you don't have to memorize this formula that I'm about to write down. So you take their dot product, you divide it by the magnitude of u squared, and then you take this number and multiply by u. So if we look at this form right here, what's inside the parentheses, the reason I grouped it up, if you take a dot product, do you get a vector? So I'm thinking about the numerator. Do you get a vector or a number with a dot product? Number. So you get a number. What about when you take a magnitude? Is that a vector or a number? So that's a number. So what you really have is one number divided by another number, which is, of course, a number. So this entire first part right here is all one scalar, or one number. So the projection is basically a multiple of u. It's always going to go either the direction u is going. If it's negative, it's going to go the opposite direction. So what happens when it goes the opposite direction? So this is what projection looks like when the angle is small. When the angle is bigger than pi over 2 or bigger than 90 degrees, they're pointing away from each other. So if we have an obtuse angle or a big angle, they could look like this right here. And what happens when you shine the light down? It goes directly perpendicular to you. And that projection vector actually goes the opposite direction of the original vector you're projecting onto. So in this case, this vector right here will be the projection of v onto u. So it'll go the opposite direction. The other strange thing that can happen is your vector v might project way longer than your vector u. So maybe u, the vector u was smaller, and v was way bigger. So same idea, we're going to look at the shadow going directly perpendicular to u, but now the shadow actually makes a bigger vector than the original. So in this case, this projected vector will be this big vector down here. So that's projection of v onto u. So it can be any of these three situations right here. There is a way for the projection to be a zero vector. How, what would the situation look like that would lead to a projected vector of zero? So if we assume u is flat on the table, what, uh, what would v have to look like? Straight up and down. So it makes a shadow that's basically the zero vector. So you can absolutely get a projection of zero. It means your two vectors were already at 90 degrees, or they were perpendicular. All right, so this is projection. <coughs> so I'm going to write do not memorize. There is a second type of projected vector, and I'll draw it with purple. All right, a good way to think about projection is basically how much of v goes in the direction of u. So how much of v is in the same direction as u? So the other projected vector is basically how much of v is going perpendicular to u. So if we look right here, I can draw that vector pretty easily. It's going to be perpendicular to the projection. And the idea is that if you add up these two vectors, you'll get the original vector v. So this one's called the orthogonal projection. So I'll write it as O projection of v onto u. So it's a way to decompose a vector into one direction and a perpendicular direction. So the way we're going to compute this orthogonal projection, 
I'll write it down down below. Actually, I'll write it on the right side, and when we solve for it, we'll write it down below. So if I add the two vectors, the purple and the blue vector, I get V. So how do I solve for the orthogonal projection? How do I solve for that first vector? How do I get the second vector out of here? Nice. Yep, just subtract it. So we'll just subtract that. So the orthogonal projection of V onto U equals V minus projection V onto U. So you don't need to memorize that orthogonal projection either. You need to know what they are, but you don't need to memorize the formula. So we're going to do one projection problem, and then we'll do a few more, but they'll be in uh, the context of some word problems. So a good thing to do to gain some intuition is to graph these vectors out. So let's go ahead and graph these two vectors. They're pretty easy to graph. One, three. And one, one. Now, <clears throat> that's probably too small of a scale. So we use a double scale. So that'll be three. So there's one or three one. Oh no. But I don't want that vector. I want one three. So we're projecting the 1, 3 vector onto the 1, 1. So this is a little bit strange because your 1, 1 vector is not horizontal. So unfortunately, I can't rotate the projector. So you want to think about basically rotate your head 45 degrees. So this is, this is the ground right here. And we're projecting downwards. So we're going to project like that. So I can draw the projected vector pretty easily. So now I should give these vectors names. If I want to be consistent with the way I name them above, I'm going to call the vector uh, that I'm going to project, I'll call that V, and the vector I'm going to project on to, call it U. So I can use the same letters. So I'm going to call the first one V, the 1, 3, and the second one, 1, 1, I'm going to call U. So go ahead and compute the projected vector and the orthogonal projected vector. So I'll put those two formulas on the board. And you should have some idea of what the projected vector will look like. You just have to figure out basically how far out, what number you're going to project. And you better get something bigger than 1, according to our, looks like approximately 2.
So you should get your projected vectors 2, 2, and then your orthogonal projected vector uh, you can compute also. I'm going to draw that orthogonal vector up here in purple. You can basically see the dotted. There's two ways to draw it. You could draw it right over here, or you can draw the same vector over there. It doesn't matter which of those two ways you want to draw it. They mean the same uh, vector. All right, any questions about those computations? That just comes from the that guy right there. Yeah, but like, how how is it? Oh, why is it? Yeah. Why is this formula the case? No, like, wh how what you s like how how is that written now? Like, how do you get square root two squared? So let's see. So that was uh, if I write out all the details, that's square root squared. So we got one squared plus one squared, like that. So I'm just going magnitude of that 1, 1 vector and then squaring the magnitude. Okay. So basically the 2 cancels the square root. So we have two word problems now. And then we'll be into cross products after this. So WAG is on a 30 degree hill. Unfortunately, we only know zero degrees, 30, and 45 degrees, and 60 degrees. And all of those make really steep hills. 30 degrees is a pretty serious hill. Um, you could do other hills too, but we need to break out a calculator if we're going to have a three degree slope. So if we were thinking about uh, you know, moving something up train tracks, I think they don't get much steeper than three degrees or so. So <coughs> most hills are not this steep. It would be a good sledding hill. All right, so wagon's on a 30 degree hill, and it weighs 100 pounds. What f is the magnitude of force needed to keep the wagon from moving? And this force uh, is going to be parallel with the hill. So step one on this problem is we're going to draw a picture. So we get to draw a wagon on a hill. So 30 degree hill, maybe something like that. All right, I'm going to draw a wagon right there. That's a physics wagon. Everything in physics is a point. Until you get to advanced physics and you have to worry about the, what are they called? the torsion tensor, the uh, center of mass, and all that good stuff. But for now, everything in physics is just a point. All right, we have 100 pounds. That's going to correlate to a force pulling in what direction? Down. Down. So gravity is always going to pull straight down. So we got one force going straight down. And I'll call it Fg for the force of gravity. And if I write out in rectangular coordinates, how much x is there? So we got 0 in the horizontal. What about vertical? So we go 100, but I want 100 down. Yeah, so we're going to do negative 100. 
So you could do positive 100, but then your gravity will be pulling upwards. So you want to be careful and think about how you're choosing your axes. I generally recommend do gravity going downwards because your intuition gets kind of messed up if you flip that over. All right, so this is a static equilibrium problem. So I could uh, think about all the forces together. So there is the force of gravity. What direction would we have to uh, push to keep the wagon from rolling downhill? So we have to go parallel in the uphill direction. So this direction, we're going to need another force. I'll call it FP for the force you have to push to keep the wagon still. There is another force. If you took a physics class, or if you just know some physics, there's a third force. Anybody know what that third force is called? You took too much chemistry and biology, apparently. Yeah. It's called the normal force. So it's the same force that keeps you from falling through the center of the earth, or to the center of the earth. So it's the force at the moment your chair and your feet are experiencing. So it's basically the earth pushing back on you. It's the reason we don't just fall. I think so. So there is a third force, and I'm going to draw it. We don't necessarily need it, because the way we're going to compute here is going to be uh, we're going to use projection instead. But I could call it Fn for the normal force. So there is technically a third force. And it's the, the reason you go downhill is not because the direction gravity is pulling, but because the normal force is pushing you a little bit to the left. And the steeper your hill is, the more this normal force is going left. So if this hill is, you know, barely like 1%, the normal force is only going a tiny bit to the left, which is why you don't roll that quickly on, you know, a slope that's not steep. But if you're on a 45 degree slope and you're on in a wagon, you're probably in trouble. You're going to go really fast. And unless that was your intention, it probably won't turn out well. All right, so we're going to do this without even worrying about the normal force. All right, so the way we're going to accomplish this, we're going to project. So let's think about which way we could project. And I think, you know what, I'm going to change my push force color to blue, or to green, so I can use blue for my projected force. All right. Let's project gravity onto the um, hill direction, onto FP. So if I do a projection, I'm going to project gravity on basically onto the hill, which is the direction of FP. So this projection right here, oh, I have subscripts mixed in with, you know, I'm about to have subscripts, so let's not have super subscripts. So let's just call this F for force, and we'll call the other one G for gravity, instead of F, uh, FP and FG. So now I'm going to project. Which order do I want to project? Is this F onto G or G onto F, the way I drew it? So I'm going to go G onto F. So it's regular G with a little F. So we're going to go project G onto F. So if you remember static equilibrium, what that means is this projection force right here needs to be the same as the force that I push in the uphill direction. So I'm going to redraw F a similar length to the projected force right there. So they basically need to be equal opposite. So this idea of projecting, it tells us basically how much in the downwards direction is gravity pulling. So I don't really care how much um, gravity is pulling into the ground. I want to know the component that's downhill. So that's why we did this projection. So we're turning this two-dimensional problem basically into a one-dimensional problem. So we're seeing how much is gravity pulling downhill. All right, what do I know about the vector f? Do I know anything about the magnitude of f? Mm. What do I know about this vector f? 30. It's 
30 degrees above the horizon. So all I really know about F, what the heck? I know it's some magnitude, whatever its magnitude is, and I'm using the polar form, cos theta, sine theta. So it'll be the magnitude multiplied by the unit vector in the right direction. So let's rewrite that down below. And our angle is 30 degrees. That was the same as the angle of the hill. So our angle is 30 degrees. So cos 30 square root 3 over 2. Sine 30 is 1 half. So the question asked me, what is the magnitude of F? What is the magnitude of that force going uphill? So it's my goal to find magnitude F. So let's compute that projected force right there. So it's F dot G divided by magnitude F squared times F. So that's the projection. So I just used, let's see, this right here, just the projection. All right, the only problem is things are going to look a little bit ugly. So that's how to compute the projection. So the projection is basically equal but opposite to the force that I actually want. What would you say about the magnitudes of F compared to the magnitude of the projected force? Just the magnitude or the length. They better be equal, right? It needs to be the same amount in one direction as it is in the opposite direction to keep it still. So that means magnitude of F is the same as magnitude of this projected force. So what I really need to do is not just find the projected, is the magnitude of the projection is what I want to know. So what's the magnitude of this? So I'm just putting magnitudes around these. So I don't need to know necessarily the projection, I just want to know what's the magnitude of this force. So again, when we multiply these out, this is a scalar. So that entire first term is a one scalar multiplied by a vector. And so if we use the identity of what is a scalar times a vector, the magnitude of that is absolute value of the scalar multiplied by the magnitude of the vector. So I'm going to use this identity right now. So we have our scalar. This is basically alpha right here. And then what's right next to it is the vector. It's just having a slightly different name. So I'm going to split the magnitude. So it's f dot g divided by magnitude f squared multiplied by magnitude f. Good news is absolute value behaves just like magnitude. So I don't need to make a huge distinction about what is what. So absolute value of f times g is uh, divided by this other magnitude squared. I could just compute the absolute value. So absolute value splits up over division, just like multiplication. And now I have magnitude f squared multiplied by magnitude f. So I can reduce this down and We're left with this. All right, so we know a little bit about F. We know everything about G. 
So we can go ahead and plug in uh, what we have for f and g now. So I'm using this version of f. That's the nicest version I have of f. And I'm going to use the only version I have of g right here. So I'm just going to fill those two in. So there's f, g is way easier. It's 0, negative 100. We do need to make sure we take the absolute value of that in case it's negative. Divided by, I have no idea what the magnitude of f is. So just leaving as magnitude of f. All right, so compute this dot product. And then simplify. Now I'll give you a hint, magnitude of f is going to disappear at some point when you simplify. And if you're a little worried, this is just alpha v dot u, which you can bring your alpha outside and compute it like this. So you can leave your magnitude f outside and compute the dot product like this. So magnitude f cancels. We have 0 plus 1 half times negative 100, which is negative 50. Oh, we're supposed to absolute value this, so that's positive 50. So the downhill force is 50 pounds, so the uphill force has to be 50 pounds. So that's the amount, the magnitude of the force that we need to push so the wagon doesn't fall down the hill. All right, that was some fun algebra on vectors. It's a good warm up for the next problem. <laughs>